Hi kiddos, I am super happy to be seeing you today. Keep in mind, real me is in the Google chat with you, answering questions, watching your responses, checking to see that you're using your whiteboards to answer when I ask you to, and looking for your mouths moving when I ask you for a response. So please follow along as we talk about one of the most significant things that happens during the Renaissance, and that is the Protestant Reformation. As I'm writing this, I want you to be looking for the base words. Hint, it's there. Hint, there it is again. All right, I'm sure you got it. So the Protestant reformers were literally protesting. They wanted to reform the church. They didn't want to start whole new religious movements initially. What they wanted was for the heads of the Catholic Church to listen to their protests and to form themselves differently, to make some changes. Because we remember, a big part of our worldview is culture, and culture includes our religion. Taking the seriousness with which people in the Renaissance took their religion, changing it was a huge and scary undertaking. This is a big deal. So it didn't start with people saying, hey, you know what, I think I'm just gonna risk my eternal afterlife and have my own new ideas. It started with them saying, things aren't right here. We need to go back to our feudal hierarchy to really look at why things weren't right. Because we know that our feudal triangle had involved a complex pyramid scheme of taxes always moving up the ladder. This happened with your political system, your taxation, but it also happened with church politics and the tithes, that 10% of your income that people needed to donate. As this system starts to change, as we start to get this wealthy merchant class in here, as we start to get less obedience through humanism and more personal exploration, expansion, trying to live up to your own potential, right kiddos? We start people questioning things and as they're questioning, they're going, where is the money going? How do we see it? Because we have these lower clergy. These are the guys that are your monks, your village priests, the ones who are out in the city with the regular people. And people are like, hey, their lifestyle is not much different than mine. In fact, if I'm in the merchant class, these guys probably have less money than I do and are living less comfortable lives. But these higher clergy who came from noble families, they're living in palaces. They have private armies, servants. If you have been to a medieval cathedral, if you look at a Renaissance cathedral online, Google it. If you look at the Vatican, everything is covered in gold. There are riches beyond what anyone would think a church would be keeping for itself. At the same time, people are learning about religion for themselves. Because why? Because of the printing press. So hint, if you are doing your Renaissance project on the printing press, you might want to talk about this too. All right, so because people can read the Bible for themselves, they're going, wait a minute, where does this live up to the standards of the Bible? And then they start saying, you know what? It just really doesn't. You guys need to reform. So this whole movement really comes to a head in Germany. Now it is not a coincidence that it happens in Germany because what else was invented in Germany? The printing press. So the first vernacular Bibles are being distributed. This is when people start to really question religion and question the role of priests. And here are some things they didn't like. Number one, was they wanted to read the Bible for themselves. In the Catholic Church at the time, the priest would read it in Latin and tell you what it said. People were like, eh, you know, now I can just read it in my own language and I can have my own conversation with God. We don't really need to go through you anymore. Our next one was the idea of the tithe money. Where was this going? How is it being distributed? And is that really equitable? Is it a fair thing for us to be doing? We have this 
pretty neat idea as well about these things called dispensations. This caused a huge controversy. Dispensation. I can't spell and talk. Okay. A dispensation was this absolute cash grab from the church where they said, if you donate money, we will send you a letter that is stamped and sealed that says you are forgiven for your sins. And reformers were like, what? No, 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 no. That is not the way this works. I have to like be a good person and stuff. I don't just have to have money and send it to you. You're gonna hear a scoot because I'm kicking my stool to the side. Okay, so these are the big deals. We can see how the printing press impacted this. We can see how humanist values impacted this. And we know this is involving the thing that matters the most to people, their afterlife. So this is going to be a source of major conflict because in this worldview, what they're saying is your afterlife is forever. So if you're taking people's forever and you're telling them that they're doing it wrong, people are going to stand up for that. People are willing to die for that. And they do by the thousands. So here we go. It starts in Germany with Martin Luther. He's a monk. He's looking to change the way that his church works. Okay. This doesn't go over so well. The church puts him under an arrest warrant for heresy, and he is kind of condemned to death because heresy is not a second chance kind of offense. But in Germany at the time, which isn't a country, it's a bunch of principalities, they start to think there are people who support his ideas here. So these German princes hide Martin Luther. They keep him safe from the church. What you're going to do on your whiteboard right now is you're going to tell me why. What is in it for them? Yes, they kind of, they, well, they definitely, they agreed with his religious ideas. But what else? Let's get a little bit more cynical because we know, sorry, scooting stool, politics is kind of a cynical area. So thinking like a politician, what would be in it for you? Write it on your whiteboard, show it to me. If you said power, you are 100% correct. The same reason King Henry broke from the church, he wanted the power to make his own decisions regarding his marriage. It's the same reason that the principalities of Germany decided to support Martin Luther. Power, they can be free of the church looking in over them. So now, once this is successful, once Martin Luther does not die and actually founds Lutheranism, which is to this day the largest religion in Germany, we start seeing Protestantism spread in nation to nation. So after Luther, we of course have King Henry. I'm not drawing you a wobbly map. Up here in England with the Church of England, which is also Anglican. Remember how those first people, the Angles, lived here? And it became Angleland, and we speak Angleish. Well, the church is Anglican. Then we have up here the Scots. Presbyterian. We have down here in Switzerland, Calvinist. We have here in France, Huguenots. Oops, that's an O. All right, there's more. We're not gonna get into them all. These are some of the main ones. What we don't have is a couple of countries that allow this at all. These countries here are Spain and Portugal that remain entirely, devoutly, militantly Catholic. We also have the home of the church where the Vatican is the seat of Catholicism, Italy, which also remains steadfastly Catholic. Okay, I kind of ran out of board, but we get it. Why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? Why are we talking about this? Why is this like Ms. Herwig's weird religion lesson today? The reason it matters is because we are currently living in the outcome of the Protestant Reformation because this was not a smooth transition. 
This transition involved hundreds of years, thousands of people being slaughtered for their beliefs. We talked about this with King Henry, how England, within the span of a generation, went from being Catholic under King Henry to Protestant under King Henry, to Catholic under Queen Mary, to Protestant under Queen Elizabeth, to Catholic again under King James. It was a mess, a giant nightmare of a mess. In France, the Huguenots and the Catholics are slaughtering each other. I lost my train of thought. It happens. ADHD squirrel, sorry. Okay. Goodness gracious, kiddos, I really did. I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, right, so we're fighting for so long that eventually people are like, you know what? These are my neighbors, this is my family. I just don't really care anymore. I mean, if they're wrong, let's just let God sort it out. I believe I'm right, I can believe I'm right, I can try to convince them I'm right, but let's just stop killing each other. Killing each other is bad for the economy, it is bad for general life quality, and nations that are fighting within themselves are weaker against other nations. So we start to get the beginnings of religious tolerance. Some of these new Protestant countries that have learned to allow Catholicism, Protestantism, even begin to invite small Jewish communities in. Beginnings, beginnings, beginnings of freedom of religion. Then when we see the American Revolution, when we see the French Revolution, when we see the foundations of Canada, we're seeing this idea grow. This is why we need to know, because it is our worldview. We're living under it. We are all different religions in this room. We live together, we work together, we play together, and we can have our own ideas about what is happening in the afterlife, but they don't define us, and they don't define our friendships with each other. So we're allowed to create an us without having to create them, right? Humans love to do that. We love to be those social pack animals that have us all bonded together. But to do an us, we have to differentiate ourselves against them. This is the beginning of being able to say that we can have differences and still be us. All right, so we're going to go live into chat now and you're gonna answer some questions with me.